Hello, I am Jan Oberg, the director of the Transnational Foundation for Peace and Future Research in Lund, Sweden. And um, it is my duty and pleasure today to talk about um, the military, industrial, media, academic complex, which the acronym of which would be MIMAC the military industrial media academic complex. The idea builds on President Eisenhower's farewell speech in the early 60s in which he said the military industrial complex is growing and growing and growing and we have no democratic control of it and it could undermine our democracy. Therefore, watch out. And the military industrial media academic complex is much bigger today, much deeper into society, into the deep state. And it consumes way more resources and it lives way more secretly as it did 50, 60 years ago. It's actually what runs the major part of security and foreign policy. Now I have four points and the first point is that I'll present a normal common sense theory to you about what makes a threat or an enemy. Point two, I will explain to you why that theory does not work at all, but something else is um, operating uh, underneath the discussion about threats, armament, military budgets and all that. Three, I will go through what the MIMAC is, what it consists of, what the military, industry, media, academia um, are doing uh, and also how they are related to each other. And fourth, of course, that is my duty as a peace researcher who is vitally against anything related to the MIMAC because it destroys our world. What can we do about it? How can we change it? How can we get rid of that cancer on our national societies and the global society? So I start out with a common sense theory. A common sense theory would be that each country or unit, whatever it is, it makes a serious analysis. What threatens us on the horizon of 10, 15, 20 years? Is it some other country? Is it something like climate change? Is it something like civil war? Is it terrorism? Is it economic backwardness or what? And when you come to a conclusion based on an objective analysis and done by many different ex kinds of expertise, you sit down and say, okay, this is what we are challenged with the next few years. Therefore, we would like to do, you know, A, B and C to survive, combat, uh, or overcome these challenges so that in 10, 15 years we will be more secure, more at peace and perhaps be able to no longer spend that much money on threats or enemies because we have made friends. So first a threat analysis and then how do you meet it? That is a common sense thing because that's how we operate as human beings in a way. And of course, only one part of that would ever be weapons. There are many things that threaten modern industrial society or any society. If it's a poor society, then poverty is what challenges your future and survival. If hunger is very, very big, widespread, then of course, your first security priority should be to do something about your economic system, production, education, etc., so that your inhabitants no longer suffer from hunger. So 
threat analysis would, of course, imply also looking into military issues, but not predominantly. Most countries are not threatened by something that can be met by the military. To put it in simple terms, it would be a fourfold table. There are civilian and military threats or enemies out there, people who can do bad things to us. And there's a set civilian, such as economic crisis, somebody who directs sanctions or um, otherwise challenging challenges us, but not in military terms. And then there is external and internal threats. It can be terrorism from the inside, it can be civil war, and of course external could be the threat of an invasion or foreign dominance or something like that. So you get a fourfold table, inner, outer, military and civilian. Now that is common sense. It's never done by any government. When you make an analysis of what threatens you, you only analyze what you think are military threats because that fits, I'll come back to that, that fits the military, industrial, media, academic complex. So that's the common sense theory. Not even that is followed, but that what would be common sense, traditional thinking. Point two, such a common sense thinking does not exist with any government, except, you know, maybe Switzerland or Iceland that does not have an army or Costa Rica that only has police forces. But those who have a lot of weapons operate completely differently. There you start out with the assumption of some kind of machine, a pe perpetuum mobile, something that moves all the time ahead and needs resources, something that is almost unstoppable and churns out weapons, nuclear and conventional weapons, in, you know, automatically without any consideration of what the world looks like. So that is the military industrial media ac academic complex, the MIMAC. The MIMAC is a huge perpetual mobile, an unstoppable machine that does its own thing. And the main thing it does is war and weapons, weapons exports. And in order to work, to operate, it has to justify it, its existence by means of there being enemies, particularly military enemies, bad guys out there who are up to get us. And for that reason, we are churning out the weapons. Now, the assumption here is completely different from the first theory. Here, the point of departure is in reality not taken in a serious objective enemy analysis or threat analysis. It is taken in th there must be enough resources for us to uphold our military, industrial, media, academic complex. And therefore, we use analyses or assertions or assumptions about military enemies that can legitimate what we do. We construct the enemy afterwards. It's not the point of departure of a defense or security or peace politics. And so therefore, we are forced to construct, have people who construct threat enemies, threat uh, images that can persuade those who pay for this military, industrial, media, academic complex, and those who pay for that are the taxpayers. It's you and me. If we refuse to pay tax, which would be a good idea to the military, simply put it into a common foundation or some sort of fund saying we pay for hospitals and roads and all that, but we will not pay to the military. There would be no military industrial complex if everybody did it. It is only there because we as citizens accept to pay via our tax for this monster 
this cancer monster on civil society and the world. So, what threatens us, who threatens us, in which ways, is always an after-construction. It's made up, invented, imagined, asserted to make the military, industrial, media, academic complex look natural and necessary. So I hope you see the complete difference between the two uh, theories of what explains armament, warfare, interventionism and all that, and arms trade. We used to say, when we started in the peace research community, um, to, you know, really go philosophical and ask, how the hell is it possible to have such a monster, decade after decade? We had the formulation at the time that if the Soviet Union fell into the ocean tomorrow and disappeared, NATO would very quickly find a new enemy, invent a new enemy, see a new threat somewhere, and then continue its armament or even argue for more money uh, to the military, industrial, media, academic complex. Well, that was exactly what happened in, in 1989, 90, when the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact fell apart. The West had a little problem with finding out who would be the enemy. And, but, you know, every Monday morning, uh, the American foreign minister uh, woke up and could say, well, it's uh, Saddam Hussein or it's Kuwait or it's uh, uh, Mohammed Farideed in Somalia or it's Yugoslavia or whatever. Because what we should have done would be to have pulled down and dissolved NATO because the Warsaw Pact was gone and the Soviet Union, which was the enemy that legitimated it all, had disappeared, didn't exist anymore. But we didn't do that in the West. Triumphalistically, we decided to expand NATO instead to serve the military, industrial, media, academic complex, certainly not to make a peaceful Europe. So here we are, it's not about enemies, and I'll come back to that when I come to the M, the second M in MIMAC. Let me now move to point three and explain to you how it is that this MIMAC operates. The first is to say is, these are all elites military elites, industrial elites, media, etc., and academics, who have never been elected. They're not part of a democratic process. They operate as elite groups, connected to each other all the time, strong bonds, personal bonds, um, interest bonds. They're not elected, and they operate behind formal policies. You may think it's your government who decides these things. But they know how to uphold their own interests, how to construct enemy images so that taxpayers will keep on paying no matter what. And politicians will know that if they go against the military industrial complex, they may be gotten rid of. My own thinking about it without having investigated it is John F. Kennedy was probably murdered because he had made a big speech saying we need a completely different way of thinking about security and peace and we do not want an American imposed peace all over the world. We want peaceful coexistence. Or that Martin Luther King was killed not for his opposition to segregation and racism throughout the American society, but because he coupled that issue with the war machine, with the MIMAC, with the Vietnam War. That was what was controversial. 
So the first group, of course, of these elites who are interconnected, and often, by the way, are people who move from one elite to another. They may have been government ministers, and then they become board members of military companies. Or it may be the military who, a military person who, after being pensioned, get into an industry. Or it may be, as in the case of, for instance, the Danish liberal newspaper, Politiken, uh, the former uh, chief of defense in Denmark is now a board member uh, of this newspaper and a number of other newspapers in the corporation. And you ask yourself, why on earth would a person with no media experience, who's never edited anything, uh, get such a job? Well, because there's a connection between military interests and what is written, written in the media. So look always for where do people come from and who do they serve or who did they serve and what kind of values do they bring into, you know, a job they suddenly get in another sector. It's kind of revolving doors, you know. You have human rights people who were formerly of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and they can then argue for humanitarian intervention with military means, um, that type of stuff. The first group, of course, in the mimic is the military. The military is char characterized by consuming social funds or money, but not producing anything of value. They get the taxpayers' money. We educate soldiers to kill. We have manager management stuff. We have interventions. We have all this, but it's not contributing anything to society. It's not producing anything of value. It's not that we, like in some other countries, you know, or formerly you know, poor countries had an army that was working, let's say, um, in, the, in the countryside, in the agricultural sector, doing useful things or producing value. It is, if you will, a, a, a sector of society that exploits the rest of productive work in our society. And of course, it's part of the state. We don't have private armies, we have a state army. The government has an army and a military uh, ministry of defense. And we have soldiers that operate, you know, with uh, our flag and all that. So it's a state institution. The second group is the industry that produces the weapons and sells them, together with the state that gives the permission to export them. And that industry, of course, is also, you may say, kind of unusual, un, uh, useless from an economic point of view. There is a common fake argument that the military industry produces jobs. And that, of course, is basically true. Those who work in the military industry, which is millions of people around the world, they do have an income from the job they conduct, and researchers have it in their laboratories, researching and developing new weapons. But my point is, if you had invested an equivalent amount of money in civilian sectors, such as schools, health, culture, whatever, you would have gotten much more money out of it because one billion dollars invested in the military sector in production of weapons is capital intensive to a very high level. The investment goes to machinery, to um, instruments, to laboratories, and not to human beings being employed. So if we disarmed and changed all the military jobs to civilian jobs, we would get a much better economy worldwide. So, of course, in the industry sector is included also research. Military research and development, R&D, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, the single biggest research in the world. The, the single biggest in terms of people employed in that. There's way more people who work to develop new weapons than there is to um, research cancer or, or climate problems. Huge investments are going in there uh, at very sophisticated, expensive laboratories and corporations. So here you see the cooperation between state and private 
the military and the industry. And it makes it so strong that it is uh, connecting the state and the military uh, industry in a way no other sector does. The third group is the media, military industrial media academic complex. The media probably are not aware of it themselves, but they have as their job to present enemy images to the people, to the taxpayers who then say, oh, I'm glad I'm contributing with my tax to make my country safe and my children living in peace. They tell you also who the enemy is in the sense that this threat is growing or this threat is going a little down. But there are only negative stories, and that's the important point, there are only negative stories about those who are pointed out as our enemies or the threat. So long story short about that, they serve as a kind of public relation marketing uh, authority serving the military. It's very seldom you hear mainstream media people asking anybody in the MIMAC why they are operating the way they do or why we really need a new Cold War or what is the idea and what do we hope to achieve by this new intervention and warfare far away. The media are, and I'm talking here about the big mainstream media, are all on the side, more or less. There are small exceptions here and there, and the individual journalists, but by and large, the media are inside that murky society that we call MIMAC. And I'm saying they may not necessarily know that they are because they are selected to be there because they have the right attitude. Then comes the academia. They develop the doctrines. They develop the ways of thinking, the theories that can legitimate it. They will come as experts on television and then tell you why it is we need more weapons in our society. They are, to put it crudely, not marketing people. They are a priesthood. If you believe in what they say, you believe in MIMAC. And MIMAC actually has in the modern existentially empty society acquired a role of a kind of God. God, you know, is somebody, <laughs> somebody that nobody has ever seen, but seems to, you know, steering everything in our lives. Um, and if you believe in it, it's okay. And if you don't believe in it, uh, you have a problem, you don't belong. So basically, academia develop the thought structures that makes the MIMAC natural and acceptable. And then, of course, there's a complex. It's a complex in the sense that they're all elites. They are all interconnected. They are all closely connected, revolving doors, as I said. They are stable. No matter what happens in the world, there are new enemies that we can legitimate our armament with. Uh, it is obvious that the real government is the military, industrial, media, academic complex. And people think it's very important who is the president of the United States, for instance. They should be much more concerned about who runs the military, industrial, media, academic complex in the US, because that has the power to decide warfare, interventionism, the budgets, etc., uh, of the military uh, and the uh, other elite interests. And they will definitely be against all kinds of attempts to do disarmament or um, civilian conflict resolution instead or cut down budgets seriously. And also you should know that this military industrial media academic complex does not, is not based on a market function. There is, you see, only one buyer and that is the government. On a normal market there are many buyers and that decides the price. This is a market which we call monopsonistic. And a monopsonistic market is one in which you produce things only for one buyer. And that's the state. And that's why any weapon system can get at any price level, can be as expensive as they please. 
because when the government has invested, said we will buy these corporations, um, air f fighter aircraft or something like that, you know, the prices can be increased over time uh, with no problem because there's no other competition. There is no competition in the system. That is what is called Pentagon capitalism, Pentagon state capitalism, if you will. And that's why these uh, systems are so enormously expensive. I want to say also that everything I've said now includes not only conventional weapons, but nuclear weapons. Nuclearism, the whole thinking about having these huge weapons that can destroy humanity this afternoon, about which we all live in denial, are included in this military, industrial, media, academic complex. It's not separated from, separated from it. It's actually probably, in a way, for those countries that have nuclear weapons, by far the most secret community. And mind you, no country that has nuclear weapons have ever had a referendum or election about having them. They've just been imposed, you know. Suddenly they are, we are acquiring nuclear weapons. Governments never asked their people whether they wanted to be defended by nuclear weapons or whether nuclear weapons were something the population would accept being used in the name of their country on somebody else. So this whole society, secret murky society behind the, the official power, is, as I would say, a cancer that is spreading, a social, social economic, social political, social psychological, social media monster, which I would be we're ready to formulate it this way, either we get that under control and we begin some kind of disarmament and abolition of nuclear weapons, or we will not exist at some point in the future. There's no way this system can keep on being exploitative of scarce resources in the rest of society. And also, and that's the important point, never create security and peace. I mean, we're told again and again, we need this new weapon system in order to make, to be more secure. Now, that then takes a few years or months, and then somebody out there gets some new weapons that makes us insecure, and therefore, we need some new more weapons. It's like a drug addict. If this philosophy of the military-industrial media academic complex were able to create peace, we would have had it long ago. Now, the first theory, if you remember what I said, the common sense theory, would be able to do that. But not this one. This one must exist with a permanent production of weapons and warfare. It can never, this system by definition, the mimic I've explained to you, can by definition never ever lead to a peaceful world or a single society or countries where the population feels good, safe, and at peace. This is intellectually, philosophically impossible because it's a death machine. It's a killing machine. It's a machine that needs enemies, and to have enemies, you sometimes actually smash them up. Fourth and last, then, what do we do about it? Now, I would be a prophet if I knew what to do about it, because millions of people have been working against it for many years. But I have a few points. Simple as they may sound, I don't see much else to do. Public education and research, intelligent research, not intelligence research, but intelligent research, free research, that can keep on revealing the lie about this being a security and peace structure. The MIMAC must be revealed as what it is, a huge cancer on the global body that does no good as cancer doesn't. It's a fraud. It's a deception of taxpayers and their money. Secondly, we need to change to a completely different way of thinking about how to handle crises, enemies, and threats, where the main thing will become conflict resolution, conflict action, negotiations, and all that. When we have problems, because I'm not saying there are no problems and there are no conflicts, 
What I am saying is it'll go madly wrong one day if we keep on having this system here. Also because weapons have to be tested. Now, a completely different defensive defense coupled with conflict resolution, nonviolence, negotiations, mediation, and all these kinds of things, which would cost only a fraction, perhaps two or 5% of what the present military, industrial, media, academic complex costs, we would create a much more secure, benign, just world. And we would put the military to do useful things, such as humanitarian work or something like that. I've always believed that NATO had good people, um, well-trained people, high technology and communication and transport facilities. Take all the weapons away from NATO and any other military uh, alliance or system and put it to the best use for people around the world in need. I'm sure the people sitting in NATO don't want war. They're not getting, you know, uh, excited about war, they see it as their job. And that job could be much better if they were not doing anything for warfare, but for peacefare, if you will. I think it's very important also that we agree to hammer home the point that nuclear weapons are now illegal. They are illegal by treaty, by the UN treaty from January this year those who have nuclear weapons as part of their MIMAC, and all countries have a MIMAC, with a few exceptions, but the worst ones are the nuclear MIMACs. They must stop. We must have sanctions against them. We must have diplomatic isolation against them. The fact that no matter what other conflicts they have, the nuclear powers agree to have nuclear weapons is a civilizational challenge for the rest of us. And let's look at all the countries that do not have nuclear weapons and let them gang up, if you will, against those who keep on having nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons like cannibalism, slavery, absolute monarchy, child labor, rape, must go. Doesn't belong to civilization. And if a Mi'kmaq cannot survive without that, then let it fall. Next and second last point, you must stop living in denial and live as long as if there is no threats and no nuclear weapons. We can all be gone tomorrow. But technical failure, human failure, by miscalculation by politicians. While I speak here, it has just been re revealed by Daniel Ellsberg in the US. I won't go into him, but he's a man who long ago should have had the Nobel Peace Prize for what he's done against nuclear weapons and militarism and interventionism. Revealed that in 1958, the US military wanted to bomb China for the issue of having related to Taiwan, the other China, if you will. Now, how do we feel about it? Are we aware that perhaps today there are military people in many countries with nuclear weapons who are thinking of and arguing for that if A, B, and C, then they shall be used. You're not going to be asked or consulted. Allegedly, all the nuclear weapons in the world are run, operated by about six, eight hundred people. Politicians, military, bureaucrats, people in uh, strategic defense command centers, etc. It's a very small group of people, of seven billion people who are running this show. We must, for God's sake, be able to get rid of them and put them to do something else. And finally, don't trust anyone who talks about enemies because they always have a secondary motive. Enemies always come because somebody needs them, as I told you. This is the whole thing. They may not be real enemies. And secondly, they are invented. For a long period, it was Russia. For a period, it was Somalia. For a period, it was Slobodan Milosevic in Yugoslavia. For, at the moment, it's a new Cold War against China. 
I don't know at the moment whether there's anything more stupid and self-destructive and misconceived than having an American unilaterally declared, pursued Cold War against China. The main offense of which is that it's growing stronger, bigger and becoming, will become, if it has not already become, the world's largest economy. And because they think completely differently from how we think in the West. So this is, to make a long story short, some of the things we must do. We must debate it, we must write about it. Whenever journalists don't mention it, we must mention it. The military, industrial, media, academic complex. This mimic must go like all other bad things we have let go in the name of human civilization and because we want to survive, because this stands as the main single biggest obstacle for world peace and world development. Thank you very much for your attention.